and welcome to the new series. Weird time to be alive, right? Corona, political incompetence, seeing this in a national newspaper. I've made a Russell Howard sex robot to keep me company during lockdown. Do you know what else is weird? It's just you and me. There's no audience here. This room is emptier than Prince Andrew's diary. But for some people, life is getting back to normal. It was backpacks, pencil cases and masks at the ready today as children in England and Wales began returning to school, many after almost six months away. Do you know what I find strange? In some schools, you have to wear a mask, but in all pubs, you don't. Now, I'm no expert, but surely, if people spend a day in the pub versus a day in school, probably going to be a bit more reckless. I refer you to this headline. Drunk man tried to have sex with an ambulance. I don't care how much you love geography. Nobody learns about the water cycle and fucks a fan. Well, not nobody, but the majority. It's not just masks. Pupils caught joke coughing could be sent home from school. What? How can you tell what's a joke cough? What, are they going to have VAR for snuffles? Just the teacher, you coughed four times? I was covering a fart, miss. It gets worse. Apparently, children can be suspended for humorous, inappropriate comments or statements related to the coronavirus. Suspended for joking? Well, there's going to be some empty classrooms. OK, children, what's likely to spread COVID-19? Uh, uh, fucking a bat? I'll get my coat. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. We're men who have silence, Jason. You can't ban laughter. Kids will always take the... It's pretty weird for me to tell somebody off for laughing, but it's because there's, like, five people here, man. I feel lonelier than my sex doll. The point I'm making, you can't ban laughter. Kids will always take the piss, whether it's in the classroom or behind a reporter's back. It's pretty chilly here now because we're picking up that breeze, a really brisk breeze from the southeast. A really warm day across our region. Temperatures in many places have got up into the high 20s in Celsius. Some areas, 31, maybe even 32 degrees. Mind you, it's not just kids going back to school. Adults are being urged to go back to their offices. The government's launching a PR blitz to persuade people that it's safe to do so. And what was that gentle PR blitz? Go back to work or risk losing your job. Get back or we'll burn your fucking house down. The government shouldn't scare people back. They should woo people back. And I've got the perfect idea, right? We send Dominic Cummings and Matt Hancock on a national office tour and everyone gets to kick them in the bollocks. We had Eat Out to help out. Let's have Dropkick the Smug Pricks. Always think. You know the biggest piss take? We're supposed to go back to the office to save the economy, but at the same time, they're doing this. The Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, has warned that the country needs to be ready to move on if a deal isn't struck at this week's Brexit negotiations. He says there's still time to reach an agreement, but a no deal would, in his words, be a good outcome for the UK. No deal's a good outcome? Hang on. When you were trying to get elected, you kept banging on about this. We've got an oven-ready deal, oven-ready, ready to go. We have it, ready to go, oven-ready. Whack it in the microwave, put it in the microwave, prick the lid, uh, put it in. <laughs> we have a, an agreement that is ready to go, it is oven-ready. Gas mark four, it's that, it's ready, it is ready to go. Ready to go? His deal is as oven-ready as this quiche. The country is taking more of a pounding than this thing. But then we shouldn't be surprised they're so incompetent. This is a government that advertised a head of pandemic preparedness job. And when did they do that? Six months into the UK's coronavirus outbreak. Let me repeat that. They hired someone to prepare for corona six months after it started. Now, call me mad, but surely better prepare for something before it happens. I'm pregnant. Not if I put on this condom. We're having this baby. I've deleted Tinder. We never met. Head of pandemic preparedness. Who's he hiring? These two. You picture Boris. Oh, yep, this is Marty and the doc, and uh, they're going to travel back in time and uh, fix everything. And uh, as long as nobody calls Marty chicken and he doesn't try and fuck his own mum, I think we are going to be tickety-boo. 
It's exhausting, isn't it? We're in the middle of a global pandemic and our leader spent weeks talking about a song. They're trying to restrain me from saying this, but I, 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 if it is correct, which I cannot believe that it really is, but if it is correct that the BBC is saying that they will not sing the words of Land of Hope and Glory and Rule Britannia as they, as, as they traditionally do at the end of, of last night of, of the prompts, I think it's time we stopped our cringing embarrassment about our history. I wonder why he's talking about this. Could it be that he's using it as a distraction, never mind Brexit, coronavirus, looming mass unemployment and record numbers using food banks, let's argue about a song written in 1740. It's almost like the government want to keep people divided. If they're shouting at each other, they can't shout at us. That's why Jacob Rees-Mogg tweets things like this. Britons must never be enslaved by political correctness which led to Labour MP Neil Coyle tweeting this. Royal Britannia was a song for shit lickers. If only there was footage that proved that. <laughs> shit lickers. Royal Britannia is an absurd song. We're not called Britannia, and we don't rule the waves. China does. Sharks rule the waves. The moon rules the waves. Somali pirates rule the waves. And as for land of hope and glory, I'm not sure that everyone is as big a fan of the lyrics as they claim. <laughs> Why do we allow the government to divide us? There's so many things that connect us more than those songs, like this man. Inches to go, and there he is. Congratulations. Well done. I mean, if you want to cheer the nation up, just show them this. Sod last night at the proms, you get those two on stage. This country will be closer than these otters. Hold me closer, tiny otter. Why sing about slavery? Why be proud of that? Why not sing about things that we love? We can still keep the old tune. Land of Attenborough and Stormzy. The NHS and T, Derek Trotter and Rodney and Chicken Jow Frazies, barbecues in the drizzle, football having a laugh. Let's celebrate what unites us instead. imaginary crowd. Now imagine that song sung by these two. Of course, the king of misdirection and hate is Donald Trump. Look what he compared police shootings with. Trump compares cops who shoot civilians to golfers who miss putts. You can't compare murder to golf. When a golfer misses a putt, innocent people don't die or the Ryder Cup would be fucking horrific. Get it right, Rory! Get it right! Think about what you're saying. America is broken, and it's his job to conjure words so powerful they heal a shattered land. But instead, Trump talks like this. Protesters, you know what I say? Protesters, your ass. I don't talk about my ass. You don't talk about your ass. Can you imagine? Any other world leader talking like that? Angela Merkel, what do you think about the economy? Man for China, it's my business! He's almost beyond parody. I really got into that, didn't I? It's, he's almost beyond parody. I mean, check out what he claims is the new public enemy number one. Cans of soup. Soup. 
and they throw the cans of soup. That's better than a brick, because you can't throw a brick. It's too heavy. But a can of soup, you can really put some power into that, right? <laughs> soup. So let me get this straight. Guns are fine, but soup... Uh... That's scary. Here's an idea, Donald. If soup's so dangerous, why don't you arm the police with it? Maybe then, innocent Americans wouldn't be killed by people whose job it is to protect them. Let's be honest, the reason Trump is banging on about soup and stoking racial tension is just to get re-elected. Now, that is not a problem for Vladimir Putin. He tends to do this. The most significant domestic critic of Vladimir Putin was, without doubt, poisoned with Novichok, the German government concluded today. Ah, democracy. If Russia was any more corrupt, it'd be FIFA. I mean, in some regard, you have to admire the spots. Pro-Putin media are saying Alexei Navalny was hospitalised after heavy drinking rather than poison. Heavy drinking? He was drinking tea. Who are they blaming this guy? Is Putin bothered? Absolutely not. He's got bigger fish to poison. President Putin says Russia has approved a vaccine for coronavirus which has been tested on humans for less than two months. Anyone fancy it? Fuck no! I'd rather stand outside a pub dressed as an ambulance. And has Putin had the jab himself? What do you think? <laughs> Vladimir Putin says his daughter has received Russia's first approved COVID-19 vaccine. I am so confident I give it to my daughter. My daughter, expendable. And my other daughter, doesn't matter. And my other daughter, number three. And my other daughter, thingy. And if they work, I will give to my son, Vladimir the Magnificent Sun Prince. Cup of tea, Russell? No, thank you. Sushi. You're all right. One-way ticket to Salisbury. I'm trying to work, fellas. In sporting news, it's been four weeks without football. But finally, she's back. Now, the new Premier League football season will start on the 12th of September and finish on the 23rd of May 2021. Here's the maddest thing. Football fans are going to be allowed back in stadiums, but no chanting or singing. How will they stop that? Fans will sing about anything. Let's pretend! Let's pretend! I mean, Christ, they'll even slam birds. It's only one greedy pigeon, one greedy pigeon. The point I'm making, football makes you shout. You shout at the game, you shout at the telly, you shout at the radio. Have you ever listened to Robbie Savage? What defines world class? Because at times, I'll be honest with you, I was world class. Robbie, please. Look at your co-host face. What defines world class? Because at times... I'll be honest with you, I was world class. Football just does something to you, and it's not just humans. Let's be honest, fans will find a way around shouting. They're very clever. Remember when clubs let supporters buy cutouts of themselves for the crowds? Did they put themselves in? No. They went for this guy, Joe Exotic. This scamp, Osama bin Laden, and this rascal, Harold Shipman. Now, in Korea, one football club went further than cutouts. FC Seoul had to apologise after using sex dolls to fill seats during behind-closed-door game. We tried that. Hello, and welcome to... It just feels weird. Why are they socially distanced? Hang on, is that me? It's been a tough lockdown, hasn't it, champ? Join us after the break when we'll be putting your questions to the brilliant John Oliver. I need some ice and a puncture repair kit. Welcome back. Now it's time for a new part of the show called Life Lessons, where I challenge some of my favourite people to reflect, pour and ponder over some of life's big questions. This week, they discuss the expertise they wish they had. I wish I was an expert like them people off the chase. You know them general knowledge? Like, general knowledge is sick, like, they're just firing it out. There is one thing about the chase that I'm not entirely sure about. The big black brother, they call him the Dark Destroyer, bit racial. If I was on the chase, what are you gonna call me? The Birmingham Bomber? 
maths, maths, maths. Even saying maths is difficult for me because if there's a THS, I get a lisp. So like maths, baths, bone booths. I can't say the plural of anything TH. So even saying maths is not easy. And let me tell you one more thing. This country has a very bad history of naming their black superstars on TV. Remember Gladiators? Yeah, three, two, one, that guy when you're running up the travelator. What did they call the black brothers on that show? Shadow, Nightshade. Roads, so I'd have something to talk to dads about. I could go, oh, boy, I took that at A306. And you could go, oh, the A306, ho oh, oh, you're a braver man than me. Languages, in French in particular, so I could just move to Paris and be, I don't know, brilliant. <laughs> I have that theory that if I did that, that would just happen. The one thing I always wish I was an expert in is a musical instrument. Every time I'm in a pub or whatever, I was like, I wish I could just whip out a guitar or a piano and just start a sing-along. But I can't, because when I was a teenager, I liked drinking in the park. I wish I was an expert in either the dark arts or archery. Males, men, the mandem, male human beings. I wish I understood you lot. It's so confusing. If I was an expert in men, I would have so many Gucci bags that I didn't have to pay for. I'm buying my own Gucci bags, guys. Someone help me out. Honestly, I don't want to be an expert in anything. It sounds exhausting. Everybody's asking you for advice and like, ugh. That's too much work, being an expert. Also, I just feel like the smarter you get, the sadder you are. I'll stay dumb. I wish I was an expert in vaccines. Next up, because you, the audience, can't physically be here, I thought a good way of getting you involved was if I ask our guest your questions. This week is the Emmy Award-winning star of last week tonight, the brilliant John Oliver. That's our show! John Oliver is a comedian, actor... Scar, 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 no. ..and multi-Emmy Award-winning host of Last Week Tonight, where he's tackled everything from the Chinese government to the tobacco industry. Just the disease lung! And where his piece on Donald Trump became the most watched content on HBO of all time. Even broadcasting from his home hasn't stopped him. This is weird, isn't it? This is definitely weird. John, great to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks. Great to be here, Russell. So, these questions, nothing to do with me. I'm not responsible for these questions. We yeah, asked the so audience. You've completely outsourced uh, your job at this point, right? One to of my jobs. People yeah. that watch this show. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. In the in the guise of, oh, this will be fun. We'll do it together. But really, it is fully abstaining responsibility. That's one way of looking. I just at want it. to be clear about what we're about to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate what you're trying to do. Uh, you're trying to paint me out to be this. Uh, let's call it an Ellen figure, but that <laughs> bullshit won't work. <laughs> I'm a I'm a good guy. If the haircut I'm... fits, Russell, yeah, wear it. True, true. Yeah, it's a bad time to look like her. I could really do with her zhuzhing it up a bit. <laughs> right, our first question is on video. Hi, John. My name is Tessa, and I was just wondering, how did it feel to watch Liverpool finally win the Premier League, and how did you celebrate it? It felt absolutely amazing. I'd, I, was, I wasn't emotionally ready for it at all, which I know is absurd, considering how far they were ahead. But it was only, it was like in that last five minutes of the Chelsea game. It suddenly hit me, oh shit, oh shit, they're about to win the league. Then when it happened, I think with the everything, all the horrors that were happening in the world, I, I did kind of expect it not to mean as much to me as it would have otherwise. And mm. the truth is, I think it might have meant more. Yeah. What, watching Klopp afterwards get emotional uh, and leaving the interview because he didn't want to cry on camera, I found absolutely emotionally devastating. But you've always he, been He a made man. me cry, and it's the first time I cried this year, which is crazy for all the terrible things that have been yeah. happening. What really got to me was feeling so happy for them and then watching him kind of short-circuit himself with emotion and walk out of the interview. It was... I, I, it meant so much to me, that far, far, far more than I thought it would. Yeah, yeah. Right, let's have another question. What's your favourite cheese? 
Oh, uh, I'd probably go with a sharp cheddar now, but as a kid, what I liked more than anything else was Edam. And one of the greatest birthday presents I ever had was a whole Edam, whole ball of Edam. It was absolutely amazing, just looking at it, thinking, it's the whole thing. Wow. It was brilliant. It was a great present. How is that a great present, you fucking maniac? Like, I know you're being, you're being wistful. It's a, bit, it's a bit of cheese. I'm talking like, do you remember those Air Jordans? You, you're wrong to think about it. It's, it's not a, just a bit of cheese, is it? It's the whole of something. It's all of a sudden having the whole world at your fingertips, as long as the world encompasses simply Edam cheese. But what did you write on your Christmas list to Santa? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I didn't say Edam cheese, please. Yeah. I think he, he riffed that one. Yeah. I think what I probably said was a bike. What's happened there is your mum and dad, they've panicked and, and they've thought, oh shit, I tell you who we have missed, John, he's a simple sod. Get him that big, the big red one, not the mini baby bell. Tell you the, what, not... if that, it worked. Yeah. I've forgotten a lot of presents that I got. I never forgot that Edam cheese. How old were you? I would have been maybe seven. Fuck me, they should have taken you away. <laughs> you should have gone straight, <laughs> straight to social services. Wow. Um, next question. Hi, Russell. John. Lungile from South Africa here. Big fan. Excuse the quarantine beard. Question for John. In what way, if any, has doing the show changed the way he views the world? Thanks. First, quarantine beard. Fully excused. And honestly, I would consider keeping that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, that beard frames his face very nicely. Yeah, it certainly does. How has making my show changed the way that I view the world? Mm -hmm. uh, I guess there's a bunch of stories that we've looked at that um, that I didn't know much about going into. So I kind of feel probably more, more informed than I would otherwise have been. Because the great luxury is having a research department who can go into huge detail on a subject. Mm -hmm. So it's really about learning all the stuff in a story so that when you start chipping stuff away, you can know that you're not making a mistake. Mm. We've got another video question. Hi Russ, hi Joel. Uh, how do you make your cups of tea? I mean, Excellent what, question. I mean, that, There's only one, one way I know how. <laughs> bag in first. Hot water on top. Give it a swirl. Bag out. Splash of milk. Walk away. <laughs> my my mum was from Liverpool. She, she is, all our time growing up, did not think that it was one tea bag per cup. It was, you should be able to get a second use out of that tea bag. Oh, really? Yeah. So you stretch tea bags and you had cheese for Christmas. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? The more I'm talking about it, the more I'm painting a Dickensian childhood <laughs> that I actually cannot quite live up to. Next question. Why that fucking rat painting? You know what, you know what I'm talking about, just why. Yeah. Do you, I, do, you, do you know what that is? I've seen it. I think we can actually see it here. So that was very, very early on in the shutdown yeah. in America. And so we'd found this video of this art auction decades ago. And it was very, very funny. So then it, it felt like, oh, at that point, you kind of want to see that painting. So we, we put out a, like a large charitable offer uh, with the promise that um, if someone could track that painting down, we would pay it to a local food bank. And they found it. And boy, oh boy, when that thing turned up, there was first like a surge of euphoria that I'd not felt for a while of kind of, I can't believe something good has happened in this world. <laughs> then it was thinking, what am I going to do with this shit? <laughs> <laughs> because we've been taping the house with my children in it. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, we, I tried to keep them out of the room that we'd set up as a studio. Yeah. But my four-year-old did get in there once and say, what is the, what's the rat doing? I thought, Oof, what is the rat doing? Yeah, I mean, that's a... Daddy says, that's a... That's a short question that really requires a long answer. It's not what the rat is doing, it's what those rats are doing to and with each other, son. Yeah. First, I need to explain to you the concept of KY Jelly. <laughs> so, yeah, that... <laughs> or it was it felt like either that or it was just turning the painting around and saying, don't worry about it. Yeah. And uh, I went with option B. Yeah, but that must have blown his little mind just opening a door in his family house and suddenly there's a TV studio where you do your show. It's a Narnia situation, right? It's the forbidden fruit. Like you're told, don't go through that door. It's like, okay, I'm definitely going through that door. And then he walks in and he can see this like makeshift desk on a camera. And yeah, he, he sat in it for a bit, looked around, got bored and left. I love so, that. So yeah, he, the, the magical Narnia to him held his attention for about 45 seconds. There's you pumping out A-grade satire and your child's like, yeah, 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 dad, 
What's that rat doing to that rat behind you? What? I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do a bit here. Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah, talked yeah. a bit, yeah, sure. See, it seems like this is going to be the funniest part of that bit, though. <laughs> that is true, so, yeah. But this is what I love. So you, you don't... It's so funny. So you do the show in your house, and then yep. you don't have a green room, you don't get to have a couple of drinks, you don't get to hang out with the guys you make the show with oh. and, and have a little sort of moment of calm. Describe <laughs> what happens when you finish your show now. When I finish my show now, I press stop, <laughs> feed the files... I then open the door and then there's two children on the other side of it saying, finally, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> All right, OK. So right, it's just I've been thinking about police brutality a lot, so it's hard, <laughs> it's hard to, now, to now watch Paw Patrol with you and not see some systemic flaws in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. See, there's a, little, there's a little hand at the door now. Well, that is not oh, chilling in any way. <laughs> what? A sec. I'll be right out, OK? Yeah, all right. He's, it's the he's, li he's literally shaking his backside at me right now. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right, let's have another question. What's the one British thing you're worried your kids will miss out on growing up in America? Ne negativity? I mean, you're their dad. <laughs> you know, I mean... Yeah, you're right. I should, I should be able to clip the wings of their optimism. Yeah. Um, at the moment, they, they're pretty happy-go-lucky, but... I don't know, give me, like, two more solid years with them and they'll probably, their long size will elongate. <laughs> hey, John, let's have another video question. Hey, Russell, hey, John. Um, now that we know having a celebrity as president may not be the best of ideas, um, I was just wondering if you guys could pick two celebrities to put onto the ballot for president and vice president, who would you pick? OK. First, obviously, we have to deal with the fact that it's an absolutely magnificent head of hair. Yep. What he ha is wearing on top of his head is not a world that I can inhabit. Yeah. It's so distracting, I genuinely cannot remember what he just asked. Oh, no, that's right. No, it's actually a self-contradiction. He said, I think we've seen that having celebrities as a political leaders is not a good idea. And then he's repeating the same mistake that society has made over the last half a decade. Yeah. And he said, what celebrity? Well, none. That's the, that's the point. He is... That, that guy's thinking with his hair there. Yeah. <laughs> Right, John, what kind of bird do you feel most similar to? Flightless birds. That's, that's, that's what I feel... <laughs> that's what I feel closest to. Birds with wings. So there's, there's a kind of... There's an evolutionary promise that you're going to be able to soar majestically, yeah. but you can't get your fat bird behind off the ground. Yeah. I have to that's, f that's how I feel. A flightless bird. A bit like, you know, worms. Worms must stay, like, when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, there must be a moment when a worm looks on going, well, that's, that's got to be us. Yeah, what's my future? Yeah, and it turns... Right, and what your future is, it's being cut in half by a, by a shovel. Yeah, or your, or your mum going, don't worry, we can have sex with ourselves, and then she shows you. Um, wh why has Attenborough never done that? Why is Attenborough never... <laughs> Here we see... Um, he's, wait, he's, he, he's, he's waiting for the last thing that he does. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and it's just... Imagine that. And like the time. Fi the final he's episode. just going to take out the, the worm episode research from a shelf yeah, and yeah. say, it's or it's time, like guys. David, no. Yes. Yes. It's time. Yes. It's time for the ten animals that I find most fuckable. At number ten. And it's just this kind of banana. And then he's replaced by, like, Danny Dyer. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, <laughs> oi, oi, that <laughs> worm just watched himself. <laughs> oi, oi! <laughs> Press the red. Is that a monkey? <laughs> <laughs> Same diff. Actually, not Danny. Oi, oh. oi, animal! <laughs> yeah, exactly, right. You're probably like me. You've probably been to the zoo a few times and you thought, I like gorillas, but what are they capable of? Well, today, we're going to fucking find out. I've jammed one. I've for... asked multiple times if I can fight a gorilla. <laughs> They've said no. <laughs> But I tell you what, they seem so angry with me, they're willing to give me a chance. <laughs> exactly. I would They've I... said you should name animals. Bullshit, I've named this one Keith. <laughs> Final VT question. Hi, John. Big fan. Here's a question for you. What would be your death row meal? <laughs> <laughs> I mean... <laughs> She really enjoyed that. <laughs> it's do you know what I love the most? It's the makeup. Oh, she's put a lot she's put a lot of makeup on for you. 
For anyone who doesn't know, oh, that was... She's very good. That was my mum. very good because there's a, a relish there. Yeah. In, don't think of it. Don't think of it as sad, John, this meal on death row. Don't think about what you've done to put yourself in this situation, and you have put yourself in this situation. <laughs> Let's think about what we'd enjoy the most, <laughs> shall we? Yeah, what so. would be <laughs> death row meal? Yeah. I've got to ask with a sunniness completely at odds with the situation. Yeah, exactly. Now you may have you may have murdered an entire street of people, but for the time being, you've still got taste buds left. So I don't know what your view on the afterlife is, <laughs> but you know, some people would think you're gonna burn in the fires of eternal yeah, hell. Best. So are we doing a pudding? <laughs> They're going to run. Oh, that's them. very good. But she, but it's a good question. It is. What would you have? What's your, um, your death row meal? I'd be torn between going Italian and going Indian. Have a bang bang. Have them both. <laughs> have a chicken madras lasagna. I'll have that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll <laughs> I mean, have that. I'll have that. Because at least in digesting it, I might actually think about what I've done. Well, this is the interesting thing, because I asked my mum that question years ago. I said, yeah. what would your death row meal be? And my mum said, what have I done? And I said, you killed eight people with a hammer. And she said, oh, Christ, really? And Jenny we said, I'll, I'll just have toast. <laughs> <laughs> just because she was just so horrified by what this fictitious version of her had done. She's like, nah, it's just... No, we don't. <laughs> just <have> toast. <laughs> yeah. She's right. She's right. I enjoyed that immensely, my friend. Um, Thank you very much for no coming worries. on the show. Good luck with it all. Thanks. And um, go look after your son. Yeah, I will. All right, I'll see you later, guys. All right, well done. See you later, John. Thanks so much. See Ta Welcome back. Now it's time for the People's Poll. We asked people to tell us how their lockdown went. Now, we had thousands of responses from social media, and we've got some of them here in the studio. Kind of. Hello! Hello! Hey, look at that. What a lovely bunch. How are you? Good, thanks. Good. Thank you. Great. Well, let, let's, uh, let's crack on. The first question was, what was your weirdest lockdown moment? First one appearing in court by video while sitting in my bed in pyjama bottoms and a suit jacket. Well, I didn't know Harry Maguire was a fan of the show. Next, uh, when I went for a walk for the first time after being ill and saw this. Wow. Country file got hot. How about you guys? Jess, I'm going to pick you first. What was your weirdest lockdown moment? So, uh, we do family FaceTimes every Sunday, and one Sunday morning, my grandma is sat there and she starts giggling away to herself. So we ask her what the problem is, and she starts telling this, this story about Saturday night. That somebody has posted a warm saveloy through their front door. Wow. And they have no idea where it came from. That is amazing, though, isn't it? Um, yeah. But I love the idea that there's someone who's really hammered, who's just kind of walking along and go, that house needs a snack. <laughs> Just pop that in there. Right, now to put this bra on this tree. <laughs> Pretty weird, though, Jess. That's up there. Let's see who else. Matt, what was the uh, weirdest uh, thing that happened to you? Well, I, I moved house over lockdown, uh -huh. and um, I decided to get these cassette tapes, the video cassette tapes, transferred to DVD. Yeah. I spent my entire life believing that they contained footage of my mum and dad's wedding. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> What did they? Yeah. Did what was the wedding like? Uh, well, I don't know because unfortunately they, it, it, it's not the wedding. What, what is it? It's just my mum and dad's sex tapes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, here, here we here we go, Matt. Here we go. Um, wow. Okay. Um, what, have you watched it? <laughs> Only as long enough to find out what it was. Right. How long does it go on for? Not, I mean, not that you'd know. You're not, not going to sit there with a stopwatch. But how long is the video? The video is 18 minutes long. I mean, that's um, all right. Let's not muck around. Well, no, I could do it four times in that length. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a question, Matt. Did you find yourself watching it, watching your dad going, oh, I do that? 
Um, no, I, I thought, well, that's not where I get my small one from. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Has anyone made a sex tape? Put your hand up if you... Uh, Marie, that was a definite... That was an excellent look, Marie. It was absolutely not. I'm looking at Laura and, um, and, and Laura's partner. <laughs> you guys, yeah. have you ever um, shot a film? <laughs> no. no. Yeah, there's some angles you just don't ever want to see yourself from. That's right, yeah. Sophie? Quietly sip me wine. Yeah, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, I get it. So you're more of a watcher, Sophie, I understand. Just sort of sat in the corner. No uh, that... <laughs> what would be great if, yeah, if you're actually conducting one as we speak. Now... You never um... know. <laughs> right, um, Zach, first things first, what a fantastic castle you got in the background. Uh, yeah, that was my uh, panic buy. Oh, really? The week naught of the lockdown. Um, it is a 6,020-piece Lego Hogwarts castle. Wow. I mean, you know, it both makes and ruins your kitchen because now <laughs> you can't prepare any food. Uh, yeah, it was one of the first things I bought during lockdown. Um, it was online, obviously, and um, when it got delivered, the person that was delivering it asked who it was for. <laughs> and I panicked and I lied and said it was for my make-believe seven-year-old son called Adam. Oh, wow, you gave him a name as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, please tell me you had lots of things delivered during lockdown and every time they're like, where's, uh, wh where's Adam? You're like, ah, oh, he's bloody out again, you know? Well, actually, because, because I live in a flat, I had to explain, yeah, um, he lives with his mum, so now, now I'm divorced as well. <laughs> So, wow, so you've, you've done the whole backstory. <laughs> but presumably yeah. he's then like, yeah, it's tough, mate, I'm divorced as well. Do you want to meet up for a point when this is over? <laughs> yeah, if you want. Uh, now you've got a friend. It's pretty impressive. How long did it take you to put Hogwarts together? I had to pace myself, because I, I wanted to make it last as long as lockdown would. Um, oh, Zach, that is so bleak. <laughs> 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 so you just gently took your time. I made it last six weeks, but, but I... I couldn't, I couldn't stretch out any longer than that. Fantastic. <laughs> Let's move on to the next question. How did you cope with your family in lockdown? Sophie, how did you get on with your family? Well, we sort of cracked quite early on, spending so much time together, and it ended up just being a full-blown to-do. What was the argument about? It was about which one of the Mitchell brothers, Bill Grant, was more attractive. And what? it just... That's when we realised we'd really cracked. Who did you side with? Oh, Grant, absolutely. Yeah, it, <laughs> it, no it, feels, it feels fairly obvious that it's Grant, doesn't it? Like, Phil... Yeah, no. there's a case for Phil, so... OK, let well, let's, let's throw it to the group. Uh, hands up, everyone who would go for Grant. <laughs> yeah. And, Marie, you're a Phil lady. Yeah, what can I say? What's not to like about Phil? <laughs> I like the beer that. belly, the, the sweat, the alcohol. You know. <laughs> but, apart from that, he's a dream man. It's the noises, well, Marie. It's the... <clears throat> like, when he picks up a pen, he's like... <clears throat> There's plenty of grunting on this exclusive video, if anybody's interested. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the next question? Let's have a look. What was your worst homeschooling moment? This should be good. Uh, let's have a look. When my son wrote fuck you, mum, on his homework sheet. Wow, that's pretty bleak. Marie, uh, did you have a, a homeschooling moment? Yes, because my daughter turned into Inspector Clouseau and would just pop up everywhere. Uh -huh. So, as a result of several incidents over the course of the months, I had to teach her about periods. Wow. Jeez. She, how, how old is she? She's seven. OK. Why did you have to teach her about periods? She thought I was dying. Right. <laughs> and she offered to stick the big plaster on me. Wow. <laughs> so, so how did you explain that? Because presumably, I, I mean, that's... I just told her that it was something that all women go through and she was absolutely set on the fact that she will not. Yeah. So we'll cross that bridge when we come to it, as far as I'm concerned. Oh. And also, I've learnt to lock the bathroom door. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you sound like an amazing mum. That's so matter-of-fact. I think so. But this is... I love the idea, you go, this is what happens to all women, get used to it. <laughs> you know get what I mean? used to it. Yeah. It's going to happen for a long, long time. I like the top, Russell. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, this is great. Um, I think we've got the, the final question here. If you could have been locked down with anyone, who would you have gone for and why? Uh, OK, Jermaine went for Prince Andrew, so I can lock him in a hot room for a month and see if he'll sweat. 
good. Uh, Claire went for Jesus, as he could turn water into wine. Uh, yeah, but also think of the food. That'd be ridiculous. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Bread and fish again. Um, how about you guys? Who would be your dream person to, um, to lock down with? Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg. Well, it has to be somebody that cooks. Cooks. Um, during Good. lockdown, I, I've managed to pester the life out of everything in the garden and um, no, and got no results from it. So somebody like Hugh Fernley Whittingsdale, yes. I think he, he could find you a good meal from amongst the weeds and stuff like that. Oh, I love that. I love the fact, Laura, that you're sending him out to forage. <laughs> <laughs> that is the idea. Get out there. And um, Ian, has she ever sent you out to forage? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, we are good at it. We've it, made some bizarre things. You look... <laughs> There's it, a lot of things out there that you can eat, you just don't want to. Right. But you, you look... Ian looks like the kind of guy that could go into a woods and really, really deliver. Do you know what I mean? You look like you should be in the woods, Ian. You've got that look. You look powerful. You look like you could chop wood with your hand. You've got that look. That's been his new hobby. Yeah, <laughs> don't know that. I tell you yeah. what, I tell you what, Laura, do you know what I, do you know what I hear? I hear a home video. <laughs> <laughs> the woods cutter. That would be nice. Let's make it. We'll go halves on the profit. <laughs> Nice. Well, I enjoyed that. It was lovely speaking to you. I think if this little chat has taught us anything, it's a very small cross-section of the country, but it would indicate the lockdown was fairly strange for all of us. But that was fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the show, guys. Uh, especially Matt. I mean, you really shared then. That is fantastic. <laughs> It took a lot to share that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm glad you did. Um, thanks so much to the rest of you for coming on the show. It's been a lot of fun. Have a fantastic night. See you later. Bye. Bye. See ya. Finally tonight, it's Good Deeds with an amazing man getting on his bike to help out his community. My name is Emdad and I run Book Bike London. We deliver books on our bikes to vulnerable people and families in our community. I started volunteering when I was nine or ten. My greatest inspiration for volunteering is my parents. They've always had an ethos of helping yourself, but also helping others. I'm known as a prolific volunteer, and I volunteer 365 days a year. I have received the MBE for my community services in Tower Hamlets. Coronavirus and the global pandemic has really brought home what it means to be a part of the community, people who are homebound, vulnerable, people who are suffering. And what I've noticed is, I don't have to do a lot. Sometimes it could be just to knock on the window to say hello to someone. Book Back London is actually my first solo project. And the simple concept is to bring about happiness and smiles by delivering books on a bike. On an average day, I would cycle anything between 10 and 30 kilometers. Many people who I bump into don't have access to books the way I do. And I just want them to be able to share the pleasure I have when it comes to books. Come out there and let's see you all. Do you know what Mama's dressed as? Santa Claus. Oh, where's Wally? But good guess. So Book Bike is for children, families, the elderly, and a lot of people who can't afford books. Getting a book makes us feel that we're going to have exciting adventures because it helps you with your imagination. And we think he's quite kind. Yeah. The M-Dad's lifted my spirits. That is something we'd all, all aspire to be like. Just let people know they're, they're not alone and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, there's people there for him. People who need to read books, they can't afford the books. Books are very expensive. So when I donate the books, I know I'm improving somebody's literacy level. Got one more collection left for today. It's not a usual route I take. Let's see how it goes. Hello. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon At to you. At your service. I've got some books for you. Wonderful. I also found out you're a Liverpool fan. <laughs> I've got you a Van Dyke T-shirt. Oh, my goodness. Is that right? We really? Wow. Does that fit? It's kind of a one-size-fits-all. So these are the books. Fantastic. Pleasure. There you go. Thank you so much, Ali. Well, thanks for doing yeah. this, mate. It's an amazing charity. Oh, it's absolutely brilliant. And, and an um, amazing way of being uh, well-read and fit. <laughs> totally. Do you know what I mean? Totally. And I've always admired him from a distance. But having met him now, my estimation of Russell Howard has gone up that much higher. Awesome. Nice. Well, nice to meet you, dude. You have a great day. I will, too. Thank you. Enjoy the books. Thank See you. ya. It doesn't need a lot of people to make a difference. If you actually make sincere intention, 
to make a difference and do something good, you will do it. Book Bike will be going on as long as I live. I'm open to other people replicating it, taking my support and advice and guidance and continue to hopefully run this project long after I'm not involved. Lovely stuff. Thanks very much for watching the show. Good night, my friends. Good night.